Okay, I think that we'll get started for the uh, final session for the day. My name is John Wagner. I'm a professor uh, at the University of Minnesota in the Department of Pediatrics. My area of interest is in the blood marrow transplant program, and what I do is to develop new treatments for patients with life-threatening diseases, particularly cancers and other genetic diseases. And so it's not surprising that I'd be chairing this particular session, which is going to be focused on human subject research, uh, including patients with impaired decision capacity or the vulnerable patient population. Certainly there are multiple dimensions to the vulnerable patient population, and this ranges from the potential subject with progressive loss, as we discussed this morning, decision-making capacity, such as those with Alzheimer's disease, um, or alternatively, it could be those with emerging decision capacity, my patient population, children and adolescents who are moving into the decision-making capacity age range, and then the subject with fluctuating capacity, potentially a patient with mental illness. In this session, we're going to explore the various issues associated with performance of research in vulnerable uh, patient populations, potential risks of overprotection, unique aspects to recruitment of racial and ethnic minorities, and alternative decision makers. The goal is to identify best practices and potential areas of further investigation. What we're going to do next is we're going to actually begin with a patient uh, um, who is going to give us a unique perspective on uh, the conduct of research. The first speaker is Amy Fraunmeier. She received her graduate degree in health psychology from Stanford University and has conducted research within the Fanconi anemia population with a concentration on psychosocial challenges, coping strategies, and quality of life in adults with this disease. She's also worked for the Adolescent and Young Adult Oncology Program at the Oregon Health uh, Sciences University and has collaborated with investigators at the NIH to evaluate the role of uncertainty in decision making related to bone marrow transplantations, particularly in patients with Fanconi anemia. She's currently pursuing a master's degree in counseling at Oregon State University. She serves as a patient representative at the Food and Drug Administration. So she's going to come up and give us a unique perspective on all the work we've been discussing throughout the day today. Amy Fraunmeier. Good afternoon. My name is Amy. I'm 28 years old, and I have a disease called Fanconi anemia. I imagine that many of you are not familiar with this diagnosis. Uh, FA is a genetic disorder that leads to bone marrow failure and predisposes patients to cancer at young ages. This disease is exceedingly rare, affecting an estimated 1,000 patients in the U.S. There is no cure, and although the prognosis has improved in the last few decades, life expectancy still hovers around age 33. In my family, there were no secrets about the tragedy of FA. I was the third of three daughters born with this disease. My sister Katie died at age 12 of pre-leukemic complications. My sister Kirsten died at age 24. Kirsten had survived a bone marrow transplant after developing leukemia. She managed to graduate from Stanford after her transplant, but relapsed and ultimately died of GVHD of the lung after a two-year struggle. My parents founded the Fanconi Anemia Research Fund in 1989 to stimulate research and to provide family support. I grew up going to annual family gatherings and watched as dear friends with FA grew ill, succumbed to cancer, and to fail to engraft and transplant. FA, to me in childhood, meant sickness, pain, disfigurement, loss, and a compressed time perspective. The sense that, okay, I've got 33 years. In the words of Mary Oliver, what will I do with this one wild and precious life? My parents kept me well informed um, from a young age about complications associated with FA. But these brutal truths were tempered by messages of hope, stemming always from scientific progress and bright new ideas. I clung to those messages like air, because to me, Clinical research meant the hope of adulthood. So I was trained to look at the world through hopeful eyes, but I did not fail to notice that the messages were always changing. First, it was gene therapy, my initial promising connotation with the word cure. 
Then I learned about mouth gels developed to prevent cancer and concentrated doses of antioxidants to combat DNA damage. Then there was excitement about pluripotent stem cells. And now I'm hearing about the potential of immunotherapy to enhance cancer treatment in my population. But now it feels different because now I understand how far away all of these really are. Research within the FA population faces staggering barriers. First of all, as I said before, this disease is extremely rare. It's also extremely complex and heterogeneous. Children present with vastly different phenotypes and illness trajectories. FA is also a DNA repair disorder, making treatments available to the general population, such as chemo and radiation, especially toxic for our fragile chromosomes. Not exactly an attractive target <laughs> with which demonstrate efficacy in clinical trials. And then, of course, there's the issue of age. Historically, FA has been known as a childhood disease. Today, most patients still, in fact, are children. And this further complicates eligibility for clinical trials. For example, in 2011, collaborating scientists pursued a gene therapy trial for FA. However, they were given permission to enroll adults only. What's the problem with this? Adults with FA represent less than half of the already tiny FA population. They have fewer stem cells, and most have had bone marrow transplants, which would negate the benefits of gene therapy. Children were the only patients likely to do well and benefit from this trial, but, they were, but their participation was precluded. The trial was open for two and a half years, and not a single participant was enrolled. Researchers were finally able to make the case that children should be enrolled, and now they are recruiting successfully. But an important point here is that we lost time, lost two and a half years. And often, parents are forced to make difficult decisions in the absence of empirical evidence. I was 12 when my bone marrow began to fail. I had 20,000 platelets, an ANC of 800, and a hemoglobin of 8 and falling. I was headed for an unrelated bone marrow transplant at a time when survival outcomes wavered at 60%. My only other option was to try androgen therapy to help stimulate marrow production. Oxymethylone was the most widely used androgen at that time and was known for severely masculinizing side effects. Low voice, facial hair, etc. difficult for girls to take. But my mother spoke to three other mothers in the FA community who had tried the drug Danazol. And even though there was no support for its use in FA, it seemed helpful. She also spoke with a doctor who refused to provide information about this drug because no studies had been done. But my mother is very stubborn, and we pursued Danazol anyway. And thank goodness, I was given high-quality years. I finished high school, followed my sister's footsteps to Stanford, completed a master's degree, did some research, and now I'm happily continuing my graduate education. All without having to shave my face, and all because my mother took a leap of faith. And this drug continues to stabilize my bone marrow today. So, research has represented consistent doses of hope, fueling my next steps forward, and creative gambles have been my lifeline, buying time for the next magical something to help extend my life. But over time, the pattern of always just around the corner, always so slow, too risky to attempt with children, inappropriate to test with FA because our N is so small, all these things have tainted these hopes with frustration and a cynicism I'm heartbroken to admit. When my sisters, Katie and Kirsten, were diagnosed with FA, my parents were faced with the harsh reality that there was nothing available to help them. When I was born, my mother thought, OK, well, there's nothing for Amy now, but we have maybe 21 years, and 21 years is long enough to find a cure. And it's true that in my lifetime, we've learned a lot about the basic science of FA. We're better at monitoring patients and detecting cancer early. Methods for bone marrow transplantation have improved dramatically. But early detection and bone marrow transplantation are no cure. We still have no way of solving the underlying problem, 
FA patients remain as vulnerable to malignancy as we've always been, and cancer treatment protocols are guided by a handful of anecdotal cases. Four years ago, I began research for my first master's thesis. Through 18 interviews with, 18, uh, with FA patients and a questionnaire completed by 96 adult patients, I explored challenges, coping, and quality of life in the emerging FA adult population. Now, just four years after that project began, six of the 18 people I interviewed are dead, and a seventh just had his voice box removed due to stage four head and neck cancer. It is heartbreaking to me that after 28 years of witnessing scientific advances so hopefully, research has not translated into better treatments for this disease, and we continue to lose such precious young lives. Our fund has invested over $18 million in research grants supporting laboratories in the US, Canada, and Europe. Consistently, we draw more than 200 researchers to our annual scientific symposium, and we now support workshops on topics including gene therapy, squamous cell carcinoma, and small molecule therapies. We have brought the scientific community together over and over to plan, to brainstorm, to strategize, and meanwhile, I've been taking the same kind of medication and androgen to stimulate marrow production that was available to my sister in 1983. I agree that protection of human subjects and children in particular is of utmost importance. But I'm here to convey to you as well the urgency with which I live and to insist that we examine what it truly means to protect patients in the context of terminal illness and no good options. I need research to move faster and to move in service of the patient population. I need for patients to be at the forefront of their own medical decision-making process, aided by consent forms that speak English rather than legalese, and medical professionals who can empathize with families desperate for options other than watching the sand and the hourglass run out. We can do better for the child who deserves to have a full lifetime, for parents who are forced to make difficult decisions with inadequate information on behalf of their kids, for parents like mine who dedicated their lives to pushing science forward and watched painfully as their hopes were crushed because the system itself failed, because it is low, because it places a premium on publishing articles on basic science instead of funding translational research, because it fails to provide a potentially life-saving drug to the child with a rare disease and no other options. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Jim Du Bois. He's a Stephen Blander, Bander Professor of Medical Ethics and Professionalism, Professor of Psychology and Director for the Center of Clinical Research Ethics at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. He was also an adjunct professor at the Albert Nagy Center for, the healthcare, uh, for Healthcare Ethics at St. Louis University, where he was the inaugural Hubert Mader Professor of Healthcare Ethics and director of the Bander Center for Medical Business Ethics. Professor Du Bois directs the NIH-funded Professionalism and Integrity and in Research Program. Dr. Du Bois. Thank you. All right. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you for the invitation. And Amy, thank you for your, your presentation. And I, I think her presentation, in a very moving way, um, highlighted the need both to protect people, but also to recall that one of the Belmont principles is beneficence, and that's to do good for others. That, that, that is why we're doing research. In my talk, I'm going to talk about this subtitle here, why population-based screening for decisional capacity in research is a bad idea. And it has to do with um, gaps that it leaves, but also the way that it stigmatizes groups. And again, sort of the need to respect uh, informed consent and autonomy, while also helping people to enroll in trials and um, showing respect for them as persons. <clears throat> 
So what is vulnerability? Susan had asked me to touch on that just a little bit by way of background. Uh, the dictionary definition is simply being susceptible to physical or emotional harm or attack, and the Belmont Report would expand it a bit beyond just physical or emotional harm to include, for example, social harm, legal or economic harm. And when you accept this definition, you realize that we are all vulnerable. Um, you see this in many different scandals where, you know, you could be white, wealthy, highly educated, and if you trust your physician and your physician lies to you, you may consent to a treatment that is not in your best interest. You, we are all susceptible to harms. Traditionally, though, our research regulations have focused on specific populations. Um, our current regs really have special protections just for three groups, uh, children, prisoners, and women and fetuses. Now, NBAC, the National Bioethics Advisory Committee, uh, tried to expand this a bit and focus on five different factors that can contribute to vulnerability. And these can be mapped onto uh, populations. So for example, cognitive or communicative uh, vulnerability, you see that in children, fetuses, people who are decisionally impaired, maybe with advanced Alzheimer's or schizophrenia during a psychotic episode, um, can certainly lead to cognitive difficulties. Institutional vulnerability. Uh, if you are institutionalized, either as a prisoner or as a patient, uh, you can be more um, vulnerable to undue influence, etc. So they talk about these different kinds and what I want to focus on today is, is one of the things that binds them together, even though they all look so different, is the threat that they pose to informed consent. So the cognitive one is the most obvious. If you are having difficulties understanding information, it's going to be hard for you to give a truly informed um, consent to participation. Institutional vulnerability means it can be harder to say no. You may feel pressure. Uh, medical vulnerability, you may be so desperate for a cure um, that you're using biased reasoning, uh, that you are, you're willing to enroll in anything out of this sort of sense of this is my last hope, I have no other choices. Uh, and again, medical illnesses can, can often lead to cognitive def de deficits. People who are very sick are often very tired and have a hard time following conversations, right? Um, economic vulnerability, uh, if someone's paying an incentive, or if uh, we've talked about this repeatedly today, the only way that you get access to good healthcare monitoring or treatments is through enrollment in a trial, that can affect things. And the social vulnerability, where you may actually receive less information. There have been some studies showing that consent processes involving minority patients don't last as long. People spend less time talking to minority patients. So this too can threaten the quality of informed consent. Now Dr. Kim earlier this morning talked about one model for understanding what decisional capacity is and that's the one I'm presenting here as well uh, that grew out of the work of Paul Applebaum and Tom Grizzo where decisional capacity really means the ability to understand information, appreciate how it relates to you, which in part depends on believing the information that's shared to you, right? It's one thing to understand it and another thing to believe it really is correct and applies to you. The ability to reason with the information, weigh risks and benefits, and finally the ability to express a relatively stable and clear choice, all right? Um, Scott Kim talked a little bit about screening for capacity. I put up here, I know you can't read it, but the UBAC, which is a brief assessment of capacity that is really my favorite screening tool. So if you're trying to study informed consent, that's one thing, but if you're just trying to screen patients, this is a wonderful little 10 item um, questionnaire that relates to the particular protocol. Um, you might ask patients, for example, who are thinking of enrolling in a trial, could you name two potential risks of this study? You know, what is the purpose of this study? 
Um, if you choose to leave this study at any time, are you free to do so? All right, so it's asking very simple questions that are scored on a zero, one, two scale. There's good inter-rater reliability, good correlation with the assessments of professionals, and they have a cutoff score, which makes it really easy for people to be trained to use this. Um, now, what populations are commonly targeted for screening? It typically is just the populations we label as vulnerable. And that's what I really want to focus on here. Um, when should we be screening for decisional capacity? What should be driving that decision? Primarily the population of the participants or rather the level of risk in the study. And I'm going to argue that it really should be the level of risk in the study and that if the risk is sufficiently high to justify screening anyone's understanding and capacity, you should screen everyone's, all right? So this is a fairly packed slide, but it has a bit of a decision chart here, which shows, I think, how population-based screening works. The top in the middle is the question, does the study target a vulnerable population? If yes, then you screen for decisional capacity, if the potential subject passes the test, you can proceed to enrollment. If they don't, you typically don't proceed to enrollment. And then on the um, right-hand side of the screen, if they do not, uh, if it does not involve a, a particularly vulnerable population, you use just a standard consent process with no screening. And if there are no obvious problems during the consent process, you can proceed to enroll. Now, each of those yellow bubbles highlights what I think is a real problem, and I'll, I'll have a slide on each of those. But in essence, I think the problem is that um, when, we, when we don't screen populations that we don't label as vulnerable, even though all of us are in fact vulnerable in certain regards, uh, it can be stigmatizing. We will also miss participants participants with cognitive impairments, because they're far more common than we think. There are far more causes of cognitive impairments than we think. And um, finally, it also um, really confuses the fact or misses the fact that very often when a participant doesn't understand the consent information, the problem is not with the participant. It's with the consent process. So I want to touch on each of those really briefly. Problem of stigma, you know, people know when they're being treated differently, all right? Um, and the stigma attached to mental disorders, to Alzheimer's, often leads people to avoid seeking treatments, all right? Um, when Dr. Kim referred to the United Nations Convention on Persons with Disabilities and the fact that they're opposing screening for capacity, um, it can sound irrational because let's face it, it's a bit of a nightmare to think that someone might enroll you in a risky study when you don't understand the information and you're not capable of making a decision. But it's also a nightmare that you might have decisional capacity and someone treats you as if you don't. That's also frightening. So um, what, what I wanna propose is that we need to try to avoid both of these extremes. Um, there are many risk factors for cognitive impairments. This is another problem. By screening just specific populations, you're going to miss people. So we know the psychiatric ones well, right? You think of schizophrenia, bipolar, opioid use, PTSD. Um, and as Dr. Kim noted, many people with these different disorders retain capacity. Many do not. But we often overlook the medical risk factors for cognitive impairments, heart disease, cancer, diabetes. When someone's in severe diabetic pain, it can interfere, for example, with uh, operational memory. Uh, advanced age alone is a risk factor. So when we're just screening special populations, we will miss participants with cognitive impairments who are trying to enroll in our studies. And then the, the, the other factor that I mentioned, there are a lot of reasons why someone might not do well on a um, measure of decisional capacity. In fact, I would say that the UBAC and most such tests are not measures of decisional capacity at all. They're measuring the subjective outcome of the consent process. 
That's it. All they tell you is that someone doesn't understand. They don't tell you why. They don't tell you it's because they lack decisional capacity. All they say is they don't understand. And if you look at the communication factors, these might be the reasons why they don't understand. It could be due to cognitive incapacity, but it could be due to the complexity of information and that you've not done a good job using plain language and simplifying it. Uh, it could be the timing of the communication. We heard earlier, after you tell someone they have a serious diagnosis or their child has a serious diagnosis, they don't hear much after that. So don't try to do a consent process at that point. Uh, it could be the failure to use best practices, to do the teach back, you know, to, to share the information and ask them to repeat it back to you, to explain it to you, et cetera. So um, I think for these reasons, I was on a, um, I had a conference grant from National Institute of Mental Health where we were reviewing the literature and making uh, recommendations on how best to conduct research with vulnerable populations. And our recommendation was to begin by considering the level of risk and not the population, and when the level of risk would justify assessing uh, understanding, appreciation, reasoning, then we should do it with everyone. It's less stigmatizing, and you'll, you'll miss fewer people who may be at risk of cognitive impairments. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Dr. Reagan Durant. He's Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of Preventative Medicine at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. Dr. Durant's research focuses on social support, self-management behaviors, and hospital use for heart failure, and with an eye toward uh, developing community-based interventions to eliminate racial disparities in heart failure hospitalization rates. He also studies multi-level barriers to the recruitment of minorities into clinical trials and to advance interventions to increase diversity in research study populations. Dr. Durant. So it's my pleasure to be uh, part of this um, day-long event and more specifically uh, to participate in the, this esteemed panel. Uh, I'm going to talk today about um, racial and ethnic minority participation in clinical research. And my goal for today is really just to uh, frame a discussion um, and, and sort of frame some thinking around uh, the topic of minority participation in, uh, in clinical research. So here, just first uh, uh, slide uh, showing my uh, disclosures. And uh, I, I didn't want, for the sake of brevity, I didn't want to inundate you with uh, data about the uh, level of underrepresentation. Uh, before I start on this first slide, I can give you a bit of a snapshot, though, very briefly. Uh, looking at, at FDA data from about four years ago, uh, while African Americans represent about 12% of the uh, population, the U.S. population, uh, they represented only about 5% of persons enrolled in clinical trials. And when you looked at uh, Latinos, the uh, underrepresentation was even more stark. Uh, while they represent about 16% of the population, they only represented about 1% of uh, persons participating in clinical trials. So that just gives you a bit of an idea about the uh, extent of uh, the underrepresentation and the dearth of, of minorities participating. I, I really want to focus on some of the stated uh, rationales for minority participation in clinical trials. Oftentimes, we uh, think about uh, disparities, and uh, some disparities uh, are uh, important uh, at face value. Uh, and, and sometimes, though, it's important, I think, to uh, talk about why it's important and to, and to really uh, discuss uh, in this context rationales for increasing minority participation in clinical research. Uh, this has been uh, talked about and uh, people have presented uh, rationales, but I think uh, many have not uh, articulated as well as uh, Giselle Corby Smith and colleagues. And so I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of the rationales that uh, she uh, put forth in a piece. Um, uh, dating back to 2004, but I think still holds uh, very true today. 
The first one is, I think, probably the, the most obvious one, uh, the generalizability of study results to all persons, including all population subgroups. Uh, the idea here being that if uh, certain subgroups are not uh, adequately enrolled in uh, clinical trials, then those uh, results that uh, are uh, result from, that come from those trials uh, may not be as applicable uh, to those groups. Uh, the second one is the generation of new hypotheses related to uh, health disparities. And I think this one really uh, is sort of a multi-level uh, rationale. On the first level, uh, it, it really is just that, identifying uh, differences uh, between uh, different uh, racial and ethnic subgroups. And uh, if, if minorities are not enrolled in trials, then we'll never know that these differences exist. Some of them may be more important than others, but it's probably important to at least identify them. And on the second level, uh, the inclusion of minorities in clinical trials also allows us to elucidate some of the mechanisms uh, underlying uh, health disparities. So it may be that we recognize that a difference already exists, but we may be able to generate hypotheses about why those differences exist uh, by analyzing uh, results from di diverse study populations. And then finally, and this one pertains more, I think, to bioethics than the, the uh, first two, which are more methodological, and that is the equitable sharing of risk and benefits uh, of trial participation. I think as a society, we, we all uh, strive toward a goal where the fruits of scientific discovery uh, will be uh, accessible to everyone and shared uh, equitably uh, with everyone in society. And it, part of that uh, also requires that we share equally uh, in the risk of, uh, of scientific discovery and the risk specifically of trial participation. And this is particularly pertinent to minority populations because there have been some studies uh, of, of FDA data uh, showing that uh, minority populations are actually overrepresented uh, in phase one trials uh, using healthy volunteers. Uh, so uh, you can imagine a scenario where you have uh, an oversampling of uh, minority populations in studies where they don't uh, stand uh, to uh, glean any benefit, uh, at least directly. And then on the other end of the spectrum, uh, there are phase three therapeutic trials uh, where uh, minorities uh, oftentimes are underrepresented. And in some disease contexts, increasingly, uh, cancer is the most obvious example that comes to mind. Uh, you know, there are uh, opportunities for uh, treatment uh, that only exist uh, in the context of clinical trials. And if certain uh, racial and ethnic uh, minority subgroups are not included, in those protocols, then they uh, inherently don't have access uh, to what could be life prolonging uh, or um, treatments or treatments that improve their quality of life. So um, I want to talk a little bit about what uh, funders are looking for with regard to um, minority representation in, in clinical trials. Uh, Dr. Northington Gamble discussed uh, the Revitalization Act of 1993 that was issued uh, by uh, Congress and directed uh, and, and NIH uh, uh, wanted to increase the proportions of women and uh, minorities in clinical trial uh, study populations. The uh, specific wording of the uh, Revitalization Act uh, called for uh, recruitment of women and racial subgroups uh, to allow for adequate subgroup analysis. A bit vague, but the idea being that uh, there be enough diversity uh, present in study populations to actually detect differences analytically. The Food and Drug Administration is included in this list um, for the ease of presentation. Uh, obviously, they have more of a, an, a regulatory role than one of a uh, funder, but uh, the FDA, in, over the last couple of years, has uh, developed a uh, action plan uh, to increase uh, diversity in the uh, clinical studies that uh, come to them for review. And that uh, action plan ultimately uh, will be implemented, or the plan is for it, uh, for it to be implemented. But it does demonstrate on their part a recognition uh, that this is important, particularly as we think about those studies that support uh, those uh, medications and devices uh, that ultimately will be um, used um, more widely. 
Uh, as far as private foundations and industry, uh, it really is uh, a very um, heterogeneous landscape. Uh, many pharmaceutical companies have publicly acknowledged the importance of uh, minority participation in clinical trials and, and made good faith efforts to increase diversity of those uh, industry-sponsored studies. Uh, private foundations have done the same, but it really does vary from entity to entity, so there's no uh, standardization across those uh, groups. So we've talked a little bit about what funders uh, are looking for. So the, the parallel question is what should investigators be doing? And, and uh, the disclaimer for this slide is by no means am I in the next uh, two minutes going to give you some magic bullet about how to um, increase uh, minority recruitment in every study that you do uh, from here on out. But I will talk a little bit about uh, some best practices for minority recruitment as well as retention. And I have retention there parenthetically, but it actually is just as important as recruitment. I think we get so caught up with uh, looking at minority recruitment and enrollment that we sometimes forget the retention piece. And there have been some studies that show that retention uh, of minorities in trials lags behind uh, that of uh, minority groups. I mean, I'm sorry, majority groups. And obviously, if uh, people don't complete trials, then we uh, miss out on some of the benefits of uh, minorities being enrolled in the first place. So I just want to uh, digress for a bit and stress the parallel importance of retention. In terms of best practices, again, Dr. Northington uh, Gamble talked a little bit about some of them today. I think uh, they globally can be described as principles of community-based participatory research. Uh, she talked about two um, big guiding principles. I think number one, uh, trying to advance to that shareholder uh, stage of um, engagement such that uh, there is um, some parity in decision making and also um, making sure that uh, the minority communities or whatever minority entity uh, that you're partnering with is involved at the outset, not just at the stage of recruitment or at the stage of wanting to seek funding, but really involved uh, with the conception of the idea as well as um, as well as actually carrying out the research. Uh, I think so, in terms of thinking about what we should be doing as investigators, it also may call for a shift in focus in terms of what we do. In, in terms of NIH funding, I'm sure all of you all are familiar with the uh, enrollment tables that we all probably have completed and, and perhaps agonized over. <laughs> Uh, when you are submitting an NIH grant. And uh, that focus is emblematic of a somewhat singular uh, focus on uh, the numbers. And so what are the numbers of minorities or the proportions that you actually plan to uh, recruit and enroll uh, in your study? And I would argue that uh, perhaps we need to shift that focus from one on the actual numbers to one on uh, process. And instead of uh, outlining, or perhaps in addition to outlining uh, the numbers, we should be uh, outlining what we plan to do to uh, enroll um, minorities in clinical trials. There is enough data uh, that's been generated on best practices, and uh, some of those uh, can be utilized uh, to uh, justify uh, certain efforts uh, that we would include uh, to make sure that we have adequate numbers of uh, minorities in our, study pro in our study populations. In terms of uh, our focus on race, uh, as we all know, race is a social construct. Uh, we uh, sometimes use it as a surrogate uh, for uh, biological uh, processes. Uh, but I would uh, argue that we you know, should really s take a look at identifiers other than race. Uh, age would be one of them. We have a, an aging population here in the U.S. and we need to make sure that the very elderly are included in clinical trials in adequate numbers. Uh, we uh, need to make sure that uh, immigrants are included. This is particularly appropriate here in Minneapolis with, our, uh, with the large uh, populations of Somali and, and Hmong uh, people. And then looking at social determinants of health. So income, education level, insurance status, all of these things have, found, have been found to be mediators in the relationships between race and ethnicity and certain outcomes. 
And we need to start looking directly at these things as opposed to continuing to use race as a surrogate. And then ultimately, I think, uh, with the advent of precision medicine, thinking about genetics and the extent to which uh, we can uh, use more uh, precise uh, evaluation of genetic makeup and presence or absence of genetic markers to really identify uh, those uh, susceptibilities or outcomes that formerly had been associated with race. Thank you. So our last speaker uh, for this session is Stephen Jaffe, uh, who is a, um, the Emanuel and Robert Hart Associate Professor of Medical Ethics and Health Policy at the University of Pennsylvania uh, at the Perlman uh, School of Medicine. He's a pediatric oncologist and bioethicist and is also the vice chair of the department, leading the medical ethics division and director of the Penn Fellowship uh, in Advanced Biomedical Ethics. Uh, Dr. Jaffe has led uh, um, studies uh, looking at the responsibilities of principal investigators in multi-institutional trials, accountability in the clinical enterprise, uh, research enterprise, children's capacity to engage in research decisions, return of genetic results, and the integration, and, uh, integration of whole genome sequencing technologies uh, in the clinical care of cancer patients. He currently chairs the uh, Children's Oncology Group Bioethics Committee and serves as uh, a member of the FDA's Pediatrics Ethics Subcommittee and a member of the National Academy of Sciences Committee on Federal Research Regulations and Reporting Requirements. Dr. Jaffe. Well, thanks everybody for uh, hanging to the end of the day and uh, thanks the organizers of the conference for uh, inviting me to be here and for inviting me to be your closer. Um, I'm gonna be talking about uh, a different aspect of um, research with vulnerable populations, one that was touched on this morning, uh, the question of risk and, and how we should think about risk in the context of vulnerable populations with a particular focus on children. Uh, my goals are to identify the core features of vulnerability in human research, uh, to understand the arguments for limiting risk in research with vulnerable populations, uh, and finally to recognize, and this is somewhat countervailing to the second uh, point, the danger of therapeutic orphanhood for vulnerable populations, and you heard this well uh, in Amy's presentation. I want to start with two stories that I, I hope will frame for you uh, the, the sort of two sides of this uh, dilemma. The first one is the story of Emma Whitehead. Uh, some of you may have seen this in the reporting. Emma was a seven-year-old girl uh, who several years ago uh, had leukemia and, and relapsed with her leukemia, and at the point where she relapsed, it was very unlikely that she would be cured with her acute leukemia. She was the first child enrolled at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, where I now do some work, but before I arrived there, uh, in a clinical trial of a novel genetically engineered cellular immunotherapy. And she enrolled in the trial. She got the cellular infusion within a few days, so sort of unexpected to all of the investigators. She was just as critically ill as anybody had ever seen. She was really uh, looking death right in the eyes. And um, with, with luck, uh, with uh, superb intensive care, and with some uh, real scientific uh, and clinical insights and smart scientific insight. She actually pulled through this. Uh, and here you can see on the right, uh, she's a two, she was at the time a two-year survivor. She's now about uh, three years out and is doing great. Equally importantly, obviously it was a great outcome for Emma, but equally importantly, this trial, and I've had the privilege of taking care of some of the children who've been on the trial, including some who've gone through the extraordinary critical illness that she went through, um, will revolutionize treatment for children with this type of leukemia and ultimately for other diseases as well. Now the moral in here of this story is that there's risk, sometimes real substantial risk, inherent in progress in, in taking those steps to progress in research, including with children. Second story uh, is the question of whether it's ethical to do non-therapeutic research or non-therapeutic brain biopsies in order to be able to do basic biological research uh, and, and the brain biopsies would come from children who can't give their own autonomous informed consent. It would have to be done based upon the permission of their parents. Uh, I, I, as you heard, am on the Pediatric Ethics Subcommittee, and our committee, in conjunction with a few other committees, faced this question in 2009 when the, the uh, study was brought to the FDA with the question, is it ethical to do these non-therapeutic brain biopsies? Here on the, uh, I guess, your left, uh, you can see a picture of an MRI scan, and that what's circled is a normal pons, that structure in the middle of the brain. On your right, you see a picture of a, a MRI of a child with a tumor called diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, or DIPG. You can see in that much larger circle an infiltrating mass in the pons, greatly expanding it. 
Uh, this is an incurable pediatric brain tumor. It's one of the worst tumors that a pediatric oncologist can diagnose. It's typically not biopsied because when you see that picture on the MRI scan, you know what you're dealing with. You don't need a biopsy. You can just go ahead and treat. And almost everything else in pediatric oncology, you biopsy before you treat. So labs have no tissue to do research with to understand the biology, at least no untreated tissue. And so we know much less about the biology of this tumor than we do about most other things that we treat. And so no tissue to understand biology, no progress. And so the question that came to the FDA because a protocol was proposed at Denver Children's Hospital was to do non-therapeutic brain biopsies on these children to get tissues to be able to make uh, progress. And the question that the FDA and the committee was asked is, uh, is this ethical? Can we do this? I won't tell you the outcome. If you want, you can ask me during the remarks or during the questions. So let me back up. Uh, and actually, I'll go through this very quickly because uh, you saw this from Dr. Dubois question is, who is vulnerable? And, and there's at least a couple of broad categories. There are others. One is those who have difficulty pr uh, providing voluntary or informed, cons uh, voluntary informed consent, either because the voluntariness is threatened or the, or the informed aspect of informed consent is threatened. And the group that I want to focus on here is children. Another group, as you heard from Dr. Dubois, is those who are at risk of being unfairly burdened by research. So let me back up again and ask you the question, what what justifies my imposing risks on you? If I'm a researcher, what justifies my imposing risks on you? And the first answer might be, well, of course, your voluntary informed consent. If you give me that informed consent, I'm justified in imposing risks on you in the service of good science. But what if you can't consent? For example, because you're a small child. Maybe your parents can give permission on your behalf, but the point is that's not the same as your consent. Well, benefits to you, right? That might justify it. If this is a clinical trial, where there's a substantial prospect of benefit to you, but there's some risk, you could argue, well, I'm justified in uh, imposing those risks on you. But what about if there are no potential benefits to you, but there might be benefits, including very important benefits to other people? Does that justify my imposing risks on you? And that's the question I want you to be thinking about. This picture here is of a guy named Paul Ramsey. Uh, Ramsey was a very eminent theologian and ph uh, philosopher, taught at Princeton for many years, and he wrote this very important essay on pediatric research. It was published in 19... Uh, 70, where he argued strongly and categorically against using children in non-beneficial research. He said, fine to enroll them in their search where there's a potential for benefit to them that justifies it, but not where there's no potential for benefit, including in minimal risk, trivial risk, no risk research. He took a very hard line. So to quote from him, where there's no possible relation to the child's recovery, a child is not to be made a mere object in medical experimentation for the sake of good to come. Continuing, to attempt to consent for a child to be made an experimental subject is to treat a child as not a child. It is to treat him as if he were an adult person who has consented to become a joint adventurer in the common cause of medical research. But there's a problem with that, right? It's the problem of therapeutic orphanhood. This is Harry Shirky, a prominent pediatric pharmacologist writing about the same time he was at Cincinnati Children's. And he wrote, uh, infants and children are becoming therapeutic or pharmaceutical orphans. Again, you heard from Amy. Uh, drugs, institutes, uh, drugs introduced since 1962, which was a time an important law was passed making the FDA demonstrate not just safety but efficacy of drugs, must be safe and efficacious, but only a small number of these have been studied in the pediatric age group. As a result, pediatricians, doctors tre treating children don't have the information that they need to treat children in an evidence-based way. Now, in the 1970s, the National Commission, the same commission that wrote the Belmont Report, wrote several other reports, including a very important and thoughtful one on research involving children. And the task they set for themselves was to seek to balance risk and benefit in research with children. So they had these two goals. Number one, encourage research for the benefit of children, strongly endorse that. Number two, limit the amount of risk, at least risk that's not justified by countervailing benefit, to which non-consenting children might be exposed. And remember, parental permission does not substitute for children's autonomous or a person's autonomous consent. So they said, research is approvable if, if it has a prospect of direct benefit, we can even take high risks as long as that risk is justified by the prospect of benefit to the child. But the challenging point was, well, what if it doesn't? If there's no prospect of direct benefit. They limited themselves to minimal risk, where they said research should be limited to minimal risk research or in some very constrained circumstances to what they called a minor increment over minimal risk. They did say other research might be approvable, but this requires review by a national panel. 
Now, why a national panel? Why, why do we have to elevate this from a level of the local IRB to really a national debate about approving this higher risk type of research? And so I want to quote here from a statement by five of the commissioners. It was a nine-person commission, but five of them wrote a separate statement trying to justify this actually quite controversial position. And they wrote, uh, the commission acknowledged that exceptional, that exceptional situations may arise in which considerable dangers to children or to the community at large might be avoided or prevented by exposing to children to risk attended by more than minimal risk. And here's the key statement. The ethical principles at stake are, on the one hand, the moral obligation to protect the community or to come to the aid of certain sufferers within it, and on the other hand, the moral prohibition against using unconsenting persons at considerable risk to their well-being for the promotion of the common good. These principles, I want you to pay attention to the language here. It's really, uh, it's quite lovely language. These principles are of such moment and their observance so basic to a just and humane society that any debate should be held at the most public level of discourse. Hence the need for the na a national, public, transparent, uh, representative commission or, or panel to debate this. So I want to close by leaving you with uh, this image, um, which you're probably wondering what, what the heck does this have to do with uh, anything that I'm talking about. But what I, what I want to argue is that pediatric researchers or those designing pediatric research often feel like this poor guy kind of balanced on a knife edge, not really wanting to fall to one side or the other. Uh, so if he leans far, too far to the left, uh, if, if, and, and to sort of extend the metaphor, if we're too conservative and too risk averse, then there's no progress for kids. There's no Emma Whitehead. There's none of the kind of progress that Amy was calling for, uh, for kids with uh, serious diseases. Not just for those kids who might participate in your trials, but for all of them who are gonna benefit from the knowledge that comes out of it. On the other hand, if we lean too far to the right, uh, if we uh, are too sort of risk-seeking or not sufficiently risk averse, uh, then you'll have kids experiencing uh, serious harms without justification of the potential benefits to them and without the kind of justification that a fully informed voluntary consent can provide. So I will uh, stop there and look forward to uh, the discussion. Thank you. Could I have our speakers come up? So questions from the audience. Don't be bashful. Yes. Yes, here's one. Yes, I, I was curious about whether, no, is it on? Okay, whether, whether there's an entrepreneurial solution to the problem of um, minority and underrepresented uh, groups participating in clinical research, a contract research organization um, that would solve the problems of, you know, requiring cultural shifts throughout uh, vast organizations. Why not uh, just start something up? So I, I, I think that there is the possibility um, for that in theory. I think the issue uh, that I would see as a limiting factor uh, is that uh, those standards have to be enforced. And so, for instance, for NIH, there has to be some uniform enforcement for uh, studies funded by industry or by private foundations, and then those studies reviewed by the FDA. They're, they're, right now, what would, I think, limit the potential for that is there's just nothing standardized. So it, 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 standardization would create a market. Uh, I'm not a business person, but presumably right now, without standards, there's no market because there's no, no one necessarily would pay additional monies for that expertise uh, if there, um, as long as they, there are no consequences for not meeting the goals. Uh, it's just very... Um, So there could be. I, you perhaps have more insight into the the the, um, yeah, the, 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 the perspective of a farmer than I do. Uh, from my pers from my perspective, and that is perspective of an academician, uh, 
uh, who's done some, a little bit of work with pharma, but not extensively. Uh, that is not a major requirement when um, those relationships are negotiated around uh, clinical trials. It, it, that has not been my experience, nor have I heard that from others who have been involved in those industry-sponsored studies. I, I would just say it's in pharma's interest to serve all patients. Um, and, you know, that's both financial as well as social and cultural. Can I um, quickly respond as well? You know, you know one, question, one question would be, could it work? I mean, could a sort of company sort of stand up and say, we can actually do this better than the existing companies or the existing mechanisms for recruiting participants from diverse groups into trials? And that's, you know, just sort of a efficacy question. The other question would be, what, what if any ethical concerns would it raise? And it, it strikes me that it could be done in an ethical way as long as there was no sort of sense that it was predatory. Um, so uh, if it was done in partnership with communities, with lots of community engagement, maybe even um, community-led or minority-led, um, it, it would, uh, I think the, the risk that it would be predatory would be much lower. But that would be the thing that you'd have to watch out for is that it either was in fact or in perception um, viewed as a uh, sort of predatory organization to fulfill this, uh, this very important need. Other questions? So I wanted to ask a question about... Uh, is it on yet? Okay. Uh, I want to ask a question about overprotection. Uh, creating a barrier to the development of treatment. Amy, you touched on this. Steve, you touched on this with your knife's edge. I was at a conference at Harvard Medical School last June where there was uh, really a kind of revolt of um, parents of affected children and um, adults with mostly rare diseases, uh, very negative about the behavior of IRBs, saying that IRBs were blocking and slowing access to trials and um, proposing solutions that were really based on citizen science and taking as much as they could away from IRBs. And I wonder whether you all thought about this. What changes are needed and what are the challenges of citizen patient-driven science? This is a question I think about a lot. Um, I mean, first of all, to speak to, we've had a number of challenges just in the FA community. I think that's mirrored in other rare disease populations. But uh, one big thing right now is that our population is so small that we rely on recruiting people from all over the world to really have beneficial trials that can demonstrate efficacy. Um, back in 2011, we had a small molecule meeting. And one of the benefits of that was um, kind of discovering that the drug or the uh, molecule N-acetylcysteine could have, you know, potentially be beneficial effects in the FA adult population. And so back in 2011, people from four different laboratories around the world decided, okay, we're going to go with this. We're going to create a clinical trial. Um, and I, I'd be curious to know more about kind of <laughs> worldwide collaboration when it comes to clinical trials, because it was almost five years ago that that decision was made, and nothing's come of it. Um, people have gotten IRB approval in different, I think in Spain and in Germany and in the US, but I think the process stopped somewhere in Canada, and um, we haven't been able to move forward. So I think one big barrier in rare disease populations is just that very issue surrounding the N that we need to complete trials. And that's not an easy question to resolve, for sure. Stephen? I share the concern about uh, tilt to overprotection. Um, you know, that after the event with Emma Whitehead and she came so close to dying, the IRB could have said, this is too risky, we're not going to continue to do this, we don't yet see the potential for benefit, et cetera, et cetera. They didn't do that, trial went forward. We're all happy it did. Some of the things, stories Dr. Wagner could tell you about his own research, right? It could have, you know, places in which good work could have been blocked by a very protective um, stance. I think we have to give, you know, it's not, it can't be anything goes, and there, there have to be some decisions that no reasonable parent for, would make for their child, and we shouldn't allow parents to make those decisions. At the same time, I think we have to give parents the, the sort of credit to be able to make a range of decisions for kids, even decisions that I might not make for my own kids, 
that uh, some parents might choose to make for their kids. And so uh, there has to be a range of reasonable discretion for parents to make a decision about it. And uh, I would argue that it should be quite broad, but not unlimited. But I think we need to give parents probably more credit than we do for making good decisions on behalf of their own kids. But can I follow up on that one, one aspect? And that is, is that, you know, let's say that we have a, a disease population such as, you know, acute lymphocytic leukemia where you have both adults and pediatric patients. Or take AML, take whatever disease you want where they're in both populations. You know, the argument is typically that we do this first in adults, as Amy discussed with FA, and that went nowhere. But also, you know, if we had done the very first adults potentially with ALL, they could have all died. Mm -hmm. And yet we could have excluded a population in pediatrics that could have benefited because the T cells are very different between the two populations. So why can't we do them simultaneously? I, you know, Don, I'm not sure there's a single answer to that. I think with... Um sort of just pure toxicity testing of small molecules, it might often make sense to sort of stagger the kids just sort of a half step behind the adults. But I think there's some sorts of um, interventions where it makes as much sense to go with the, ad the adults and the kids in parallel or maybe even with the kids first. And then, of course, there are situations where there is no adult analog, and you have, if you're going to sure, move forward adults, at all, yeah. you have to yeah. Uh, yeah. go with the, adult, with the kids. So I have a question? You. Yeah. So Mike Osterholm. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks to the panel, and I thank all the speakers today. I, I realize this is a very successful meeting for me because I learned so much today, and I'm walking out of here knowing less than I came in. And I think that's probably <laughs> the best sign that uh, this is an incredible meeting. Um, you know, I, I would like to throw a, something out, particularly Dr. Jaffe, to you, but I think it goes to everyone who is here today, is, you know, we have this battle with mortality. We all talk about preventing the top 10 causes of death, but if we eliminate them, there'll be 10 new ones, and I'm not sure they're any better than the 10 we have. And, you know, we have this race for trying to live forever, knowing that we're not going to. When we talk about risk to patients, we don't really measure in really what is the actual expectation for them afterwards. So we will do all these kinds of things to, to get a drug that will keep somebody alive at age 72 for 38 more days at $60,000, which is one avenue of evaluation. But then we have pediatric populations. We have, in public health, we talk about disability days, et cetera, so that, you know, we may be talking about you live a long lifetime, but your next 40 years are going to be hell. Where do we actually weigh that into, the actual risk that we're willing to take in doing this kind of work? If the benefit really is going to be marginal at the end of life spectrum anyway, and it's not going to reduce disability substantially or pain, is that a much lower threshold for how we accept risk than if it is a pediatric population or younger population where we would like to see 65 or 70 more years of life and they don't have another choice, so we're going to take a very high level of risk because it's either that or the option of nothing. And I, I don't see how we weigh that in today as we're trying to, we almost treat every illness, we treat every age, we treat every population as so somehow there's the same threshold of risk that we have to measure against. And I'm not sure that's the right case. I think we need to adjust our risk threshold based on what we hope will be the lifelong outcome of age or disability associated years after that. I don't know, it, 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 your slide of the gentleman on, whoever that was on that rock crevice made me think very much about how does that really fit into that? I'd like to say that gentleman was me, but I don't have that, uh, that sort of courage. Um, <laughs> I, uh, you know, it's a great question, and I think I agree with the spirit of your question and, uh, on two levels. The, the first level is, you know, Zeke Emanuel and colleagues in 2000 published an article that's become famous on the seven criteria for ethical research. And the first criterion uh, that they, and this was in JAMA, the first criterion that they argued for was that the research have social benefit. We haven't even gotten a risk to the individuals yet that have social benefits. So if the research has very marginal, even if it sort of goes well and is successful and has very marginal social benefit, then the question comes up, setting aside questions of risk, should we put resources, time, people's effort, subjects, et cetera, into it? And that's the first question. The second is, uh, how much risk do we sort of accept from the research? And I think there is a well-recognized uh, view that uh, there has to be some proportionality between the risks people take by entering into the research and the potential benefits to them. Um, now, adults can say, I'm willing to take very high levels of risk, even though the levels of benefits to me might be very small. It's not so clear that kids can uh, say that. But whether or not we should say, well, this is a study where the social benefits are overwhelmingly great, and so therefore we should be willing to expose individuals to risk, uh, 
I think that's what the National Commission was getting to with kids at the end. In general, they were not willing to expose kids to more than very modest levels of risk if there was no potential for benefit to them, but take exceptional situations of tremendous threat to individuals or to the public's health. And there they were willing to make these exceptions. So there is the sense of trading off the sort of potential benefit to the population with the risk to individuals. Other questions? Oh. oh, my name is Sandra Crump, and um, I would like to go back a couple of questions I skipped over. It was about creating someone to recruit minorities or creating some organization or whatever to recruit minorities. Um, I think that a couple of things, many things have been said today that would make that really a questionable issue to address. One, all of the um, talk we had earlier about the lack of trust and the lack of the kinds of issues that we have around institutions and the trust that there is between institutions and um, minority communities. Well, I'll just say black communities from the perspective that I'm in. Um, I, if, if we're talking about recruiting, then we need to talk, we, we, what we do Generally, when we do community research, we try to find someone to go out into the community and sell whatever protocol we have. They have it all wrapped up and they go out and sell it. And someone in the community gets on board for whatever reason. So we have the problem that we may create the Tuskegee nurse. In my opinion, Tuskegee couldn't have happened if it hadn't been for the nurse. And so I would be, um, I think that we need to ensure that when we do send minorities out into minority communities to recruit, that we make sure that they are not being the Tuskegee nurse. And, and also that we do some backup and have the communities identify their problems. And the question I ask at the dinner is, how do we do that? Because that's not going to happen in the current system. Any responses? So just briefly, I, I would agree uh, with, uh, with your comments. I, I think it goes back to what we've discussed earlier, and that is that uh, in, those sort of, uh, in those sorts of partnerships, the communities need to be engaged at the very outset, as opposed to midstream, and certainly not very well downstream uh, at the point of recruitment or the point of seeking out funding. Uh, I think that, um, you know, the, the sort of fallacy about um, solely relying on uh, minorities or, or relying on a, uh, an approach that where the recruiters or the investigators look like the population that you're trying to recruit. So namely, in the example you gave, African Americans uh, going out to do, you know, oftentimes uh, that, uh, even that is not a foolproof, we can, we can debate the, um, the ethics of that. But, even, but practically speaking, even that is not effective. I think increasingly um, when there's such a gulf between minority communities and the healthcare entities that serve them, uh, that person is just viewed as, a, as an arm of that, that uh, healthcare entity. And, and, and so the, the racial concordance may mean very little uh, if, if there hasn't been some trust or rapport earned uh, in that individual uh, interaction. Just one last thing I'd like to share. When I was doing my dissertation, um, I did um, recruiting of African-American seniors in North Minneapolis, and I was trying to do some initial work around ident you know, creating my documents. And when I came in and said, well, I am Sandra Crump, and I'm from the university. May I have a, you know, I'm going for my PhD in the University of Minnesota. The people got up and walked out of the room. Seriously, I had to go back and I was talking about end of life decision making. So I had to go back and recruit and regroup and come at them a whole different way. So we think that because you're the university, you're in some ivory tower and everybody's respecting you. But there are communities where you go in that you make that the last thing you say. <laughs> I wanted to ask one last question to Jim, and that is, is that uh, an assessment of cognitive capacity. Um, you know, we talk about assessing it perhaps in, in patients that are older, um, you know, or perhaps fluctuating capacity. What about children? And what about, uh, and we've not discussed the ascent process at all. 
but but you know, how do I know, especially if they if the child says I don't want something, how do we how do we bring that part and bring this into the conversation of, of assent and assessing their capacity to make some decision? Mm. <laughs> so. Um... You know, that, that's a tough one. There's been a fair amount of research on the ability of kids to understand information and, and when they start to develop it. And of course, as with adults, uh, the answer depends a bit on how complex the information is and how it's presented. Uh, I think maybe the more important issue, though, is the, the thing you raised at the very end, the dissenting child. And I, again, I would say it's not just children, but acro across sure. populations, sure. the uh, threshold that you would use to accept someone's dissent is much lower. Um, you know, if you understand what's being asked of you, can we stick you with a needle? But you don't understand exactly why you're gonna be stuck with a needle, but you don't wanna be stuck with a needle. As a general rule, uh, that's good enough. So we use a very low, um, threshold, if they just simply s seem to understand you're asking them to do something and they say no, that's usually considered um, enough. Now with kids, as you know, Dr. Jaffe was saying, if, it, if it's potentially directly beneficial for them, uh, the parents could consent, but it would take an awful lot to override that, I think. Mm -hmm. Comment? Just, just say very briefly that um, my, my best answer to that is to ask the kids for their reasons for what they want or don't want. And I think a kid who can articulate reasons that make sense is a kid that ought to be respected and we, we don't sort of overrule their decision unless in the very rare, and I think it is actually quite a rare circumstance where we can clearly make the argument that doing this particular intervention in the context of a research study is likely to be better for that kid in terms of their overall medical outcome than any alternative that's available to them. But absent that, I think fairly rare circumstance. If a kid can give good reasons, we respect them. Well, I want to thank our panelists for a great discussion on the vulnerable population.